Welcome to this new webinar of the USME Center, in which we will discuss labor contracts and terminations together with ECOVIS Beijing. Before proceeding with today's topic, allow me to briefly introduce the USME Center. The USME Center is a European Union funded project and supports European small and medium enterprises to get ready to do business in China. The Centre is an official member of the European Enterprise Network and has a network of over 170 China experts worldwide. We have four in-house experts that deal with market access, business development, legal and HR issues. We are implemented by six chambers of commerce and one of these implementing partners is organizing today's webinar, the Benelux Chamber of Commerce. The Bencham is the most active Benelux business platform in China and it's the only Chamber of Commerce which is officially recognized and supported by all three Benelux embassies in China. The Bencham has currently over 250 members, which consists of large enterprises, small and medium enterprises and individuals with an active interest in developing their business in China. For more information about Bencham, you can visit their website. Let's start now with today's topic and I shall give the floor to Annette, Business Development Manager at Ecovis Beijing. Thank you, Ilaria, and hello from my side. Welcome to today's webinar. Let me introduce myself a little bit and our firm as well. My name is Annette Heile. I'm a Business Development Manager at Ecovis Beijing. I have worked in marketing, business development and editorial roles in Thailand and Japan and now I'm happy to be in China. Equivis Beijing is a tax, accounting, audit and law firm. Um, you can find more information on our website. We support uh, many European SMEs in the Chinese market and have been doing so successfully for a number of years now. So we see our role as listening to them, understanding the challenges they face when entering the Chinese market and it is um, our job to make things work as smoothly as possible in the process of setting up a firm here and getting the tax, accounting and legal matters running smoothly as quick as possible. So let's dive into today's topic. Um, before uh, talking in more detail about labor contracts and terminations, I will give a brief overview of applicable laws. Um, then we will move on to labor contracts. Uh, I will give an overview of other applicable labor regulations and benefits before we talk about terminations. Employments are primarily governed by labor law and labor contract law. These are the two most important laws in this context. Of course, other laws affect employment relationships as well. For example, the social insurance law, the, but also others like the individual income tax law. Chinese labor law is generally considered to be employee friendly. It covers both the rights and responsibilities of the employer and the employee. As is often the case in China, many important details are laid out in regulations published by the relevant ministries or authorities. Even so, a certain amount of uncertainty remains about how to correctly implement some of the regulations. The wording of these uh, legal regulations is sometimes confusing or vague and sometimes there's difficulty in correctly interpreting these laws. But in general, a Chinese employment relationship is regulated by the following legal framework. It is primarily the labor law, then the employee handbook and of course the employment contract between an individual and a firm. So let's talk a little bit more about labor contracts. Why is a labor contract so important? What is the relationship between a labor contract and a staff manual? Um, we'll also look at open-ended and fixed-term contracts, um, the special uh, regulations that apply for part-time employees. We will talk about probation periods, non-competition agreements and confidentiality clauses. A written labor contract is a must-have and the basis of every employment. 
This seem, may seem unnecessary to say from a European perspective, but in China it is something that has to be enforced. So what happens if a written contract is not provided within the first month of work? From the second month, an employee works for a firm and assuming that he still has not received a written employment contract, an employer has to pay double salary for each month worked without a contract. This kind of punishment uh, continues um, until the situation is remedied. If it is not remedied after having worked a full year for this employer or 11 months uh, without an employment contract, then the employment contract automatically becomes an open-ended one to the benefit of the employee. Many details of an employment relationship are covered in the employee handbook, which we will have a closer look at at the end of this chapter. In this chart you see that uh, some rules will be covered by the employee handbook that in other legislations will also be governed, governed by a labor contract. This is the reason why labor contracts sometimes tend to be a little bit shorter in China than they might be elsewhere. It still contains the basic information like name and address of both contract parties, a time limitation if applicable, um, details of the remuneration and other important facts. Fixed term contracts are very common in China. But under certain, certain circumstances, a contract becomes open-ended. For example, if an employee has been working for the same company for at least 10 years. Another situation where the contract becomes open-ended is with consecutive con contracts. After the expiration of the second fixed-term contract, the following contract has to be an open-ended one. There's an exception to this rule, but it only applies in Shanghai. In Shanghai, uh, the employer has the possibility not to renew the contract of an employee after the second fixed term contract. This does not apply anywhere else in China. We already talked about the third possibility of how a fixed term contract can become an open-ended contract and that is if the employer did not provide a written contract within the first year of employment. The employment relationship with a part-time employee is slightly different. It is generally possible to employ a part-time employee without any written employment contract at all. However, we always recommend our clients to have a written labor contract. A part-time employee is defined as someone who works no more than four hours a day on average and a maximum of 24 hours a week. Such a part-time employee is paid hourly rates and has to be paid within 15 days, not monthly, which can be quite a hassle for uh, the firm since it is different from the regular payment cycle of all other employees. For a part-time employee, neither the company nor the employee pay into the social insurance system, but only a work-related injury insurance is paid in on behalf of the employee. Another major difference between a part-time employee and a regular employee is the termination. A part-time employee can be terminated immediately without any severance pay. Nevertheless, this can cause, can cause disputes if the employee claims to be a regular employee. We have seen this happen in the past. This is another reason why we recommend having a written labor contract where it is clearly spelled out what kind of employment relationship this is. Probation period. Why should a contract include a probation period? As it is the case everywhere else, 
a probation period is there to test the employee and to give both sides, the employer and the employee, the possibility to terminate on short notice without any res further responsibilities. For an employer, uh, conditions apply even for terminations during the probation period. For example, the employee does not meet the job criteria, then a termination is possible. Let me point out here that because of this, having a job description is very important because the company bears the burden of proof, even in such a case of termination within the probation period, and an employee who has been terminated within the probation period can uh, claim proof that he or she was not suitable for the position and then the job description and an employee handbook where rules for assessing the suitability of an employee are laid out are of great importance. How long is the probation period in China? It is regulated by law and can be anything between no probation period at all and up to six months depending on the contract duration. Non-competition agreements are another important part in many cases of employment relations. They are negotiable and should usually be negotiated beforehand. They apply for senior management or senior engineers in most cases. And such a non-competition agreement states that the employee shall not compete with the employer even after termination of the contract for a certain period of time. During this period of time, a monthly non-competition compensation has to be paid by the former employer to the former employee. There are certain um, standards for the height of this amount, usually labor arbitration courts consider around 30% of the previous salary an adequate amount of non-competition compensation. The Beijing courts usually use 20, a 20 to 60% range um, when it comes to arbitration. So what happens if a company does not pay, despite having a non-competition agreement with an agreed-upon compensation? Well, then the employee can be released from this obligation and can find employment even in a competing firm immediately. We generally recommend to have a confidentiality clause in any employment contract because by signing the contract and the confidentiality clause within it, the employee agrees to keep all information confidential. If the employee ends up not respecting the confidentiality clause and as a result the company suffers losses, the employee is liable to pay compensation. Some of these rules, like confidentiality, clauses are also covered in more detail in the employee handbook which we already mentioned before. So what is this employee handbook? It is a document that is highly recommended but not mandatory to have for every firm which lays out internal procedures for leave, for sick leave and behavioral standards among other things. To enact an employee handbook, a company must follow so-called democratic procedures by collecting comments and revisions on the draft handbook before it takes effect by being published. An employee handbook should cover recruitment procedures, staff performance evaluation procedures, also disciplinary punishments including terminations, also approval procedures for leave and overtime and reimbursement procedures. We often assist our clients in the process of creating an employee handbook. Since we highly recommend to have that in place, it makes the relationship uh, between employee and employer much more manageable and 
bound to these rules. Let's move on to the next chapter about other labor regulation and benefits. We will cover annual leave, public holidays, working hours including overtime and social insurance briefly before talking about terminations in the next chapter. Annual leave depends on the number of days worked accumulatively, not only in the current firm, but over the lifetime of an employee. So basically it comes down to seniority. Every employee is entitled to paid annual leave in the range of 5 days to 15 days. Everyone who has worked for less than 10 years accumulatively will receive 5 days of leave by law. Between 10 and 20 years work experience, an employee is entitled to 10 days of leave and any employee who has worked accumulatively for more than 20 years is entitled to 15 days of leave per year. Annual leave not taken can be compensated by up to 300% of hourly wages. The internal labor rules as laid out in the employee handbook, which we mentioned before, govern details. For example, the forwarding of annual leave days into the next year, if that is permitted and to what extent. Of course, firms can give more than the legal minimum of paid leave as a benefit to employees. This is negotiable and depends on the firm and the employee and any agreement that is made between them. In addition to annual leave, there are also public holidays in China. There are 11 public holidays in total per year, but they are combined with weekend work days to create full week holidays or long weekends, especially around Chinese New Year and the national holiday in October, when usually an entire week is work free by combining three days of holidays plus two additional free days, which are worked for in advance or after. This may seem irritating at first for many foreigners, but is a common practice in China. Other absences are sick leave and work injury leave, for which special leave provisions apply as defined by law and called medical period. Maternity leave and marriage leave are so-called statutory leave, also granted by law. Let's talk about working hours now. There are three different systems for tracking working hours. The standard, the comprehensive and the flexible working hour system. For most office workers, the standard working hour system applies, which allows up to 8 hours per day and a maximum of 44 hours per week. It is worth noting that, there's the, that the flexible work hour system does not calculate any hours per day or per week and is therefore most suitable for management positions or other positions with irregular working hours, such as sales staff and drivers. For those working under the standard working hour system, which is typically the case for office workers, overtime has to be compensated by additional time off or overtime payments. Overtime worked on working days is compensated with 150%, Overtime worked on weekends is compensated with 200% and overtime worked on public holidays has to be compensated with 300% of the usual pay. In certain cases, especially for weekend work, it can be compensated by time off during the week also. Let's talk about social insurance a little bit. China introduced a comprehensive social insurance system a few years ago. The contributions to the system differ by province. So the contributions paid by employer and employee might be different in Beijing than they are in Shanghai or elsewhere in China. In this example, we are looking at the Beijing values where the contributions are paid by both employer and employee for pension insurance, medical insurance and unemployment insurance. Work injury insurance and maternity insurance are only covered by the employer. 
as you can see in the chart here. The housing fund is a special type of social insurance benefit and is only applicable for Chinese employees. Both the employer and the employee pay 12% into this housing fund. There's a ceiling value that applies and that is adjusted year on year. It is three times the average salary of each specific location, which for Beijing was 25,401 RMB for 2018. This value is adjusted every year in June and we are expecting to learn about the 2019 ceiling value very soon, but it wasn't published at the time of recording this webinar. So let's now look at terminations. In this chapter, we will cover terminations by the employer, when an immediate termination is possible, and also we'll look into the severance payments. We also have a slide about termination by the employee, and we'll cover some terminations under special circumstances, for example, in the case of criminal misconduct or terminating a labor service contract. Labor contracts can end either by a termination or by simply expiring. A termination according to statutory reasons is, for example, when an employee is still incompetent after training and position adjustment or if an employee is unable to perform his or her job after being sick and after the medical period has been taken. A third case is when the objective circumstances for which the person has been employed have changed significantly. Terminations always have to be issued in writing rules on how to terminate an employee correctly are usually covered in detail in the aforementioned employee handbook. So when can you immediately terminate an employee? We had the case of probation periods beforehand. So if during the probation period you found an employee to be incompetent or in, not suitable for the position, you can terminate immediately. If an employee is found guilty of criminal actions, that is another case in which immediate termination is permitted. If an employee seriously violates internal rules, and this refers again to the mentioned employee handbook, this can also be deemed a reason for immediate termination or in the case of a corrupt employee causing significant losses for the employer, an immediate termination is possible. If an employee has a second job, which adversely affects the performance in the first job and refuses to change the situation as requested by the company, the employer may also be permitted to terminate the employment relationship immediately. Under these circumstances, immediate termination is possible without prior notification and without any severance pay. In most other cases, a severance payment will have to be paid by the employer. How is that calculated? It's calculated by multiplying the average monthly salary by the years of service and a factor F, um, which is 1 for more than 6 months of employment and uh, 0 0.5 is an if an employee has been employed for less than 6 months. The average monthly salary is defined as the average salary of the last 12 months or less before termination, less in case that the employment period was less than 12 months, including bonuses and further extra payments, but excluding overtime payments. The maximum for the average monthly salary is three times the municipality's monthly average salary. In Beijing, the maximum would be 25,401 RMB, which is three times the 2018 monthly average salary for Beijing. 
Even if a fixed term contract expires, an employer may be liable to pay severance pay. That is the case if the company is not willing to renew the contract or if the company offers a new contract to the employee but the conditions of the new contract are not the same or better as before for the employee. In this case, the employee is entitled to receive severance pay as outlined and calculated in the slide before. Let's now talk about termination in special cases, of which one is the termination after criminal misconduct. Are, is a company allowed to terminate an employment contract of an employee who is being prosecuted for a criminal offense? In short, the answer is yes. The employer is entitled to terminate this employment contract. But prosecution alone is not enough. You need to have the verdict that the employee was actually found guilty in order to be able to terminate the contract. So how do we do that, actually? What is the correct procedure in such a case? Most importantly, the employee has to be terminated within a reasonable time period. It's not possible to learn of a criminal mis misconduct now and terminate the same employee, let's say, in two years from now. The employer should follow the termination procedures laid out in the employee handbook or send the employee a notice of termination stating the reasons for the termination and the exact date of the termination. Another important point is that the notice of termination should be delivered to the employee with his or her acknowledgement, meaning in person or with some other kind of proof that the employee has actually received the termination notice, which can be difficult if an employee is already serving jail time. That may sound strange, but we have already encountered cases like this. The situation is somewhat difficult if you are not terminating a labor contract, but a labor service contract with a service provider. In such case, not labor law and employment contracts are the legal basis, but you you are talking about a service contract that you have with a service provider and this is governed by contract law and other civil law. So what should our com a company bear in mind when terminating a labor service contract? A labor service contract is an agreement between the company and a freelancer or self-employed consultant. For example, the services of a lawyer that are provided to a firm. Termination clauses are usually specified in the labor service contract. Since it is not an employment contract, no labor severance pay is needed upon termination. In certain cases, there can be the necessity to pay a certain compensation, but that is subject to negotiation. Also, in this case, it is very important to follow due procedures for example, terminating in duplicate with the company seal and obtaining a written confirmation of receipt. Another special case is when a foreign employee leaves China. If a foreign employee has been recalled by the parent company, will the Chinese subsidiary have to pay severance pay? If he, the employee is actually being recalled, as in number B, and the foreign employee voluntarily leaves China by, for returning to the parent company, no severance pay has to be paid. But if the Chinese subsidiary terminates the contract with the foreign employee, and that is the reason for him or her returning to the parent company, a severance payment might have to be paid. Let's now cover the subject of termination by the employee. If a contract is terminated by an employee, a 30-day notice period applies, unless it is terminated within the probation period, when a 3-day notice period for the employee applies. Please keep in mind that if a training agreement was signed, the employee will have to give financial compensation for the years uncompleted, depending on what is agree was agreed upon in the contract. If a non-competition agreement was signed, the employee is bound by this 
agreement as long as the employer pays the non-competition com compensation that we discussed before. The regular notice period in China is 30 days for both sides, for the employer or the employee. We often receive the question if it is legally compliant to include a longer notice period, for example a 90-day notice period, in employment contracts. This is very understandable since a 30-day notice period um, bears many difficulties for both the employer and the employee. If an employee has only a 30-day notice period, this will often uh, leave the company um, struggling to replace the employee within that time frame. So the 30-day notice period is the statutory rule and we cannot really give a clear answer because there are conflicting opinions about other notice periods and there are legal precedents for both. Some legal precedents deem any notice period of more than 30 days as invalid other legal precedents deem it valid if it is agreed on by both parties beforehand. Please consult a lawyer if you want to include a longer notice period and please keep in mind that in court such a notice period can eventually be overturned. We would also like to mention the role of labor unions. Labor unions have to be informed about all labor related issues. They are eligible to ask a company to change their actions, but their agreement with company actions is not mandatory. It is more important that they have to be heard. Especially in the case of a unilateral termination, it is deemed very important to keep the labor union informed. In practice, though, most small and medium-sized foreign invest invested enterprises don't have a labor union. Well, this was our rundown of labor contracts and terminations. I very much hope that you found this information helpful. If any questions remain, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can scan the QR code below to follow our WeChat account or visit our website www.ecovis-beijing.com where we regularly provide updates not only on legal topics but also on tax accounting and other China related topics. Again, thank you very much for your attention and your interest in this topic and I hope this webinar has been helpful for you.